Welcome, 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 everybody. Perkins just in time for my brunch. Uh, brunch on a weekday? Is that even a thing? Does brunch even exist outside of the weekends? Well, enjoy your brunch, Perkins. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Gashman. Well, folks are all in here. All, I guess. I'm sure it's not here for me, so it must be for Shadow Dark. It's the new, it's the new hotness. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do much more. So if you missed the community stream from Friday, if you go back and check that, that actually turned into essentially a Shadow Dark stream where I covered a couple things, but very quickly was informed about the rise of the Shadow Dark, in which case I looked looked at it, looked at the Kickstarter, and then picked out the Quick Start guides or downloaded them, and then we we looked at the Player's Quick Start guide. So if you're interested in the Player's Quick Start, quick start guide, go to Friday's community chat i forget which number it is i think it's number no i don't i don't not numbering them anymore but the one over one was what for she's for march 4th 3rd something like that Catherine just got back from brunch geez everybody's having brunch what am i missing no brunches for me so if you're interested in the player's guide go check that out i thought i would sort of close the loop on shadow dark with looking at the game master quick start guide I'm finding this whole thing kind of fascinating. I mentioned last night, if you missed my stream last night, or was just kind of talking about stuff, something I mentioned was that I find that Shadow Dark is interesting. It, to me, it seems like the sort of the new old school essentials, just in terms of the the sort of press it's getting, the kind of place it seems to be achieving. Obviously, it's doing very well in its Kickstarter, which OSC also did. And it's kind of like going to be the new thing. I'm very curious to see how, if this is the bridge that I think a lot of folks hope that it will be. I know some folks have already been playing with these quick start rules, which is kind of nice that they have these out there. You can grab them, play with them. Uh, from the player's side of it, it seemed pretty darn playable. It seemed to have everything. We'll see what the Game Master's quick start guide is. It will be interesting to see how this works if once a lot of folks get a hold of it, because obviously a bunch of folks have... have uh, contributed to the Kickstarter, so there will be a lot of copies of this out in the streets, as they say. Uh, and here's a, a sip of, this is just a black tea for the working man with a little milk. Um, we'll see how we'll see how it goes, because one of the things, like even today on the, I think it was on the OSR subreddit, some folks were kind of asking about, there's some discussion, I forget exactly what the thread was, on, on kind of what's holding people back or what the big barriers for the edition people. And some of it is mechanics, which I think that Shadow Dark, that's maybe the main problem they're solving for, is getting bringing a mechanical unity to OSR-ish gaming that matches up with 5th edition. And I, I've said this a bunch of times, and, you know, folks have their own... I, I know, like, for example, Daniel Bandis Keep, he loves all the different dice and all that kind of stuff. He loves the, the, uh, the, 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 the full, I don't know, panoply of different dice mechanics. But for a lot of folks, that is a barrier. And people, I've heard this before, and at first I didn't really believe it myself, but I did some more checking into it and kind of examining and self-examining. And yeah, I think that is a thing. I think when you can say to someone, you may not know what's going on, but you're always going to be rolling a D20 plus something against a number, that's going to be useful, as opposed to what you get into like BX, well, somewhere it's, sometimes it's a D6, sometimes it's a D100, sometimes you're rolling against a high number sometimes. You want a no, low, low number. And as a player, it can be really hard to wrap your mind around, well, when am I doing which one of these? And it's not always a very sensical decision. Why is this one skill D100 and this one's D6? I, I don't know. Do the differences? Okay, okay, of course, D100's more granular. Sure, but doesn't it matter in this case? Are we probably not, but we're doing it anyway? You know, and, and, and all these little idiosyncrasies, which when you become a veteran and, and of these things and it has that nostalgia, might be appealing to you for a lot of folks. It's just confusing. And when you can eliminate that confusion, I think that's good. And it seems to be a part of what it's doing. But there's a whole other part, which I'm kind of curious about, which is kind of the lack of skills and all that stuff, which a system like this, I think they're doing away with skills. You're doing role under attribute, uh, I believe is the style. He says, if I'm remembering correctly from the player's guide. So I'm interested in how that stuff is going to factor in, because that's also a barrier, the perceived deadliness, the perceived, uh, well, you're going to have to regale me with songs to make things happen because I don't have a skill that says I'm great at something. I'll be curious to see how that part works because this, I think, it seems like is really flattening out the part of if your objection was 
mechanical oddities. All right, this is smooth that over. So then it's going to be, all right, if the mechanical oddities aren't a thing that's blocking you, what else is? So it'll be interesting when, when this gets into more hands and folks start to really play it and try to recruit people to playing and kind of how those experiences are. I, I, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious to see. Uh, Catherine, I believe it is maybe roll under for attributes. So they may have, they may have kept that where it's kind of roll over for most stuff and then roll under. I think, yeah, your skill stuff is probably, I think is still roll under attributes. So yeah. Or it's rollover? Okay. I can't remember precisely. Um, well, they'll probably have it in here. So I'm going to skip over the intro stuff, not because it's not interesting, just because in just to keep things in time. Game Master, the only rule, the pact. <clears throat> okay, so we have the setting DCs. Great. So you have easy is 9, normal 12, hard 15, extreme 18. Challenge variety. Okay, rules versus rulings, all fine stuff. Digital DM says, I'm curious why they didn't dump the ability scores and just use modifiers. Only thing is strength score for gear. I mean, there's probably, well, I, I think there's multiple reasons. I think, well, one thing is, and this really is very going to be very dependent on the kind of game you run, is if you happen to be somebody who's doing lots of things, sapping your strength or adding your strength, having the extra numbers you can use, instead of going from plus four, plus three, to plus two, you kind of double that, right? So to go, if you're, well, if you're at the top end of the scale, at plus four, plus three, whatever, depending, and you're at the top of that scale to go down to plus two, you have to lose two levels of strength. I think it's pretty much two number, or maybe it probably depends, right? It's kind of it's got a curve to it, but you just get a little bit extra granularity if you are going to be you perceive or you feel like you're going to be manipulating those direct scores. So it's kind of nice to have, but I could see also on the flip side, yeah, you're going to roll that once, and then it's basically your plus two strength, and you're pretty much going to be plus two strength. It doesn't really matter that extra granularity, maybe, maybe not. It's kind of all depending. I think sometimes it's nice to have, and then sometimes I think, eh, why, do, why do I need it? Uh, but I, I could definitely see from a, on the one hand, from a simplicity sort of thing, yeah, why not just streamline that down? On the other hand, if we are appealing to 5th edition players, they're used to that part of it. So it's kind of also, well, what are you trying to, you know, what is your design goal for attributes? And maybe you're thinking, well, everyone's used to that. They kind of know it. I'm trying to appeal to 5th edition players. Who might feel a little bit funny it might seem too different if i just remove attribute score so i'm going to keep them. and then you, yeah do something like use strength for gear and then maybe down the line you could use those other stats for other things it does give you a little bit extra things to work with if you want to all right time darkness all right gear action economy information okay i'm i'm, I'm breezing i want to get into the guts Treasure. This does pertain because they are they're they're not counting. You're not counting gold pieces for experience that you get. The uh, the advancement is they're using low numbers of experience, and so you have to break it out a little bit. So poor, which you get no, nothing for, is mundane, low value, ordinary, or unexciting treasure. Normal, which would be something with good value worth protecting, or and or useful, would give you one hit point, one XP rather. Fabulous, incredible prize, well guarded, would give you three experience points, and then legendary. Something mythic, unique, or quest worthy. Uh, it's fine. Um, I don't know. I kind of like the counting silver or gold. I don't know why. I kind of like it. I feel like players too, they kind of like big numbers. Never thought that was a huge barrier, also. And I I could see just making it kind of easier, but this is fine. This is fine. The one thing, like back then, I always took the guidance of magic weapons, items that are worth. Items that are valuable to you to use and keep don't add to your experience because they're useful to you. You get a plus four Warple sword, you're not going to get experience on top of it because it's already an amazing item for you to use. Maybe if you sold it or something, you'd get it, but not. But here they're not making, that's something they're kind of smoothing over. That doesn't matter. You get a look, a magic sword is a fabulous XP. So, great. But it's fine. I mean, some of this stuff is probably going to, I'm going to be doing, I'm probably going to be doing a fair amount of, well, this is fine, but it may not be for me. <laughs> might not be for me, but it's fine. I'm okay with the large experience point numbers, but if it helps folks to just keep things simple and just say, hey, how much XP is in the third level? 30 XP, something like that. And then you just do this. That's great. I still appreciate the fact that at least that you still, it's still player facing in terms of as a player, I can look at this and say, okay, I need to get to third level, so I need 30 XP. I could go for 10 legendary scores or one legendary score and something a little less from that, or I can go for 30 
normal scores, you still can sort of pick and choose what you want to go for, which I think ultimately is what I want out of experience. I want to be very player facing and not an instance of I'm choosing. I don't like that whole milestone element of you as the GM get to choose when you level up. I don't like that so much. So at least I appreciate that element. <laughs> R says, uh, long time no see, and that they took a read through this earlier, and they don't see how this is much different than any other OSR hack. I, I mean, I agree with you, R. It isn't much different than a lot. I mean, I think what I called it on the other stream, which I guess I'll say here, is uh, does drop my glasses, is it seems to me it's basically a greatest hits of OSR hacks. It, that's that's kind of how I think. Like, they came, they looked at, look at the landscape of all the different hacks and kind of things, and, and sort of the, the, and they took kind of a greatest hits approach to and then they put it together in a nice package. And, and there is value to that, right? That's kind of old school essentials. Whole thing is really just taking something that already exists completely and saying, let's move it around and make it better organized. And boom, we're now going gangbusters. And I will say from that standpoint, this is doing more. It's not just a retro clone of something we already had and just putting a new coat of paint over it. However appealing that new coat of paint may be, they are, they are, this is its own system. But when you read through it, if you've been around the community and you've been surfing blogs for a while, if you're on G plus seeing all this stuff and even further back, back in the day, if you read all the blogger blogs, a lot of this stuff is going to be like, oh, okay, people have either put this exact same thing out there as a standalone hack, or it's been smoothed over, renamed, maybe tweaked a bit and, and plunked it. But there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, right? I think there's obviously, obviously a market for it. And kudos to her for hitting this market when nobody else had hit it. I wish I would have come up with this before. I could have, you know, I could have done this. Anybody really could have done this in a sense. I mean, writing quality and layout and all that stuff aside, but the actual content, like, hey, yeah, they put it together. They put together or they picked, picked and chose what they felt like were their, the best stuff out there, or at least the stuff that matches their design goals, which seems to be a bridge from modern gaming to old school style playing. And they tested it and put it together and put it out there, you know? It, this is, but this is very much not an evolutionary. Oh my goodness! It's more a, a revolution, or or maybe the culmination of a bunch of smaller evolutions. Uh, let's see. Rob says it seems to be a marketing extravaganza. Yeah, there is it. I mean, I'm I'm not on the take. I right. I'm I'm not at all affiliated with them. I actually reached out for a full version, and she never got back to me. I'm not surprised. And I, again, I said this last night, but I'll say it again. It's like, I kind of feel like with all the heavy, excuse me, heavy hitters in this space of which I am not one that she has, who've already looked at it and giving it a thumbs up and a raving sort of review, or at least the ones that have shown up on my YouTube feed seem to be like, it is amazing. Like she doesn't need me small fry coming in with probably uh, a less headline worthy, <laughs> headline worthy uh, sort of preview. It, it's kind of a no win for her. If she sends me the book and I, and I love it, it doesn't really add much to what she's already got going on. And if she sends me the book and I hate it or I'm not all that enthusiastic, then all it does is put a negative result that could come up in the search. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not surprised I didn't hear from her and I don't expect to, but uh, if, if I do end up getting a full version somewhere, I'll, I'll definitely go through that. But I, I do think that the quick start is nice that it, I appreciate them putting it out there and kudos to them for doing that. Because a lot of folks, I think, can and probably will just grab this free version to play. Though, you know, everyone loves their hardbacks. Uh, let's see. Dank Dungeons. Hey, says, uh, it seems like this game really hits the group of people who've only played 5e and want to dip into the OSR. Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a good way to put it. Catherine says, I think it's an equal and opposite approach to OSC, whereas that emphasized purity and simplicity. This is a cherry-picked and utterly modern game with an old-school aesthetic. Well, I think they are. They're using a lot of old school stuff. So I, I, I don't know if that's, I feel like that's quite fair. The chassis here is, uh, remember, like not like D20 for a lot of stuff is particularly new. D20 for resolving a bunch of stuff is old. Uh, it, it was just it, maybe the big changeover, which I guess from second to third edition maybe was kind of going to D20 for everything and not having a bunch of different things. And so this is kind of fun. But I mean, it's not like third edition is new out of the box. So I don't know. Uh, it's, it, it definitely is appealing to modern folks, which I think is good, right? Uh, it, like I said, it's going to be interesting to see how well that works once you get past the mechanical. Oh, the mechanical smoothness is is one barrier, and then we've got other ones. So, but let me get in here. So we have something on random encounters. I did read up on the uh, up at the front. It said that you roll 
uh, a 1d6 and on a one you get a random encounter and depending on how and depending on the danger level of the area which i think is cool and i've used similar things in the past but i like theirs you either roll every three turns every two turns or every one turn um so that's cool oh here it is how safe so if it's uh, unsafe you're gonna check every three rounds if it's risky you're gonna check every two rounds if it's deadly you're gonna check every round that's great for overland travel check for random encounters based on hours in places of rounds Ooh, so that's well that's a that's an interesting change so their overland channel travel excuse me it's decidedly more dangerous off the start of the bat so for example i think something like bx you're checking every day and i check i do more often i check every day slash night and i also will do checks when you're entering hexes but i also push out the encounter distance so my balancing factor for checking more often is that my encounter distance you could be kind of miles away from it but i want to kind of feed in that I like that to have that information. It might be close to you. It might be far away sort of thing. So that's how I try to mitigate the fact that I'm rolling more often. Now here, even in an area that I guess you could have, I, I guess you could increase this even more and have something that seems sort of relatively safe and then maybe fairly safe. So you get every six rounds, but checking once every three hours when you're running a 24 hour day, that's eight, eight checks a day. That seems like a lot. Catherine says, it seems like a lot of modern OSR ideas compiled together as opposed to focusing entirely in D&D as Arneson intended. Uh, yeah, which I think is fine. I mean, we're in, you know, I, I think that's what the retro clones and similar are before. And I think that's a lot of the OSR or maybe even properly it should be put in the NSR is not trying to necessarily just give you some, uh, it's some, I don't know, way of looking at Gygaxian or Arnesonian or Gargaxian slash Gygaxian slash Arnesonian DD. It's trying to do something a little bit different, which I think is fun. I, and I think that probably appeals to more people at this point than just another one saying, let's play back how they did in 1972, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Perkins says, I want to run a, a regular game with Shadow Dark before having any opinions. Looks well put together. It definitely looks well put together. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm only reading it. I, I can only go from a reading. I mean, I haven't read anything. Not that we've made it very far so far. I haven't read anything that's wrong. Although I think like, oh, I mean, there's things in here. I go, like, yeah, maybe I wouldn't do that, but myself, but I come from a certain place and I've, I'm used to playing it a certain way. I think for this, maybe for a lot of newer folks, are going to look at this and say, boy, this makes a whole lot more sense than when I was trying to read through, God forbid, someone who's just new to the hobby at this point picked up the first edition PHB or DMG and was trying to figure out what was what was going on. Like that was a tough, a tough, tough sledding. And this is this is not that. Uh, R says that Forbidden Lands ends up making for up making up, ends up making for a lot more checks. That's been their game of choice for the last little bit. Honestly, I like it style a lot. I don't remember how many checks Forbidden Lands does. I need to go back and re-read re re it. I mean, there's a, it, it, there's a lot that goes into it, right? There's, okay, what are the, it, you know, how many checks you're running and then what do those checks mean, I guess. In this case, we're asking for a lot of checks. So we'll see down the line if it's balanced at all by the nature of the checks, anything like that. But just, you know, when I'm just looking at it, if I was just going to plug that particular rule into my BX game, I'd be like, wow, I'm running a lot of checks. Though it is a one in six chance. So that's, yeah, I, have, I haven't done the uh, any dice, but instead of, I think in, uh, oftentimes it's one to two or, or in um, something like BX, it depends on the terrain type, which I like. So here they've gotten rid of that, at least right now, right? Overland travel, you're just checking every few hours and you can use, you're using these. Whereas, so the, the die type, the die result is always a one in six and it's just how often you roll it. Whereas in bx it's the terrain plays part i would probably want to add that back in because i like that and i've said this many times when you when those decision points in terms of travel and hex crawling the idea that different terrains have different difficulties attached means makes for meaningful decisions when the party is presented with options like hey you could take the road which is relatively safe but it's going to take you the long way around or you can cut through the swamp which is relatively dangerous but you're going to be in there a third of the time Right. So it's all, so, you know, it's all different strokes, different ways of getting to hopefully the same spot distances. We have close, near and far. I guess that's fine. We'll figure out what those means particular in particular. What's it doing? We have an activity table. That's fine. Reaction rolls go from hostile to friendly. This is all fine. 2d6 plus charisma modifier. Uh, one of the interacting characters may add their charisma modifier. That's fine. Treasure. There's a 50% chance a randomly encountered creature. Has no treasure. That probably makes sense. 
traps. We've got, oh, this is nice. So it's a, it's basically three columns of a D12. You roll for the what kind of trap it is. You roll for the trigger, and you roll for the damage or effect. So you could have something like a cursed statue that uh, is triggered by a word that's spoken, and the effect is it blinds 1D6 people, or is that 1D6 damage plus blind? What does it say there? I don't know. So those are traps. Does it say what that is? A tell traps add peril and surprise. A tell be careful not to make traps too frequent or the game pace will suffer. That's definitely kind of a new schoolism, but that's fine. Characters who search a specific area or object for a trap automatically find it. I'm fine with that. You disable them. Move restriction damage. Where? Okay, so I like the hazards too. So that could be quicksand and it's got the damage is toxic mold and you it's weakened by or is that weakening oh, certain hazards weaken or hammer i see so it's a quicksand that has acid pools that does the damage and it does it has blinding smoke this dm says it seems to be wholly focused on you getting in a dungeon staying there interested in how it handle other adventure types it may yeah that might also be a thing right which i think also fits in with the kind of modern aesthetic that is not generally into overland travel really right so you're i mean taking a few of the what, what's the tomb of annihilation annihilation and the sort of jungle crawl aside most of the things are not about moving through the wilderness so i'm not surprised that they haven't put that now of course there could be look this is just right this is the first book and hopefully with all the support that she's getting up front through the kickstarter there will be support ongoing which means that she could come back and do like basic expert because basic doesn't really have any rules for overland travel that's all in expert. So you start with basic. You're just, you, you know, you have a little bit of travel, but it's basically if you look at, say, keep on the borderlands, right? You you do have a small area, but you're not really hex crawling. It's not even in hexes. It's all in squares. You're not really concerned with getting real too far and really engaging with the wilderness as a thing. Then along comes experts, Isle of Dread. You're, now you're kind of more into your true rules for hex crawling. So they could be doing the same thing. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to speak for them, but totally. Be. But yes, it does seem to be that the overland, overland travel, but they're giving you rules to conduct it. But at least so far, it doesn't seem like that's a, uh, that's a big focus. All right. So we got a table called something happens with a whole bunch of stuff on it. Stuff like you smell lilacs and hear faint ghostly laughter or a runaway wagon crashes towards you. A pair of yellow eyes watches you from the darkness. All right, so that's cool. And now these are all neat. And maybe this book would be very useful. Just, I mean, these are things you could use these tables. You don't need to be using the whole rule set. So that's always nice. The rumors, I think, are going to be all over the place. You could probably want to roll some of these up and see if you want to turn them into encounters. I don't know if I'd want to roll them just at the drop of a hat. Like, oh, we go into the tavern. What do we, what do we hear? And then roll some of these because all kinds of stuff in here. Some of them are kind of specific. The Cyclopean ruins of Tal Yule lie deep within the forest. You know, that kind of thing. But it's cool. Can definitely give you inspiration. Now we have another D100 table of ruins encounters. Bandits, goblins, beastmen, gelatinous cubes, scarab beetles, a rusty portcullis, slams down, separating the PCs. Some of these are kind of specific obviously for different types of ruins so the rusty pork holes might not make sense if you're looking in kind of oh we're in sort of a what the acropolis or the parthenon it's probably not going to have a situation because it doesn't mostly doesn't even have four walls for being separated by pork is slamming down but i would maybe move that to a dungeon type encounter but whatever R says, I feel like something happens, like something happens tables are fine, but I always like area specific encounters because 99% of these are useless depending on where you are. Yeah, you gotta, you might have to roll a few times. This is true. Get into some monsters. I do like the art. I mean, the art and layout is very good. I, I, I know some folks, when I looked at the player side, were critical of the type size and just that, oh, it's not, maybe not using the space as efficiently as it could, but I don't mind this at all. And as someone whose eyes are starting to require glasses i'm totally fine with airing on the side of making it nice and readable i mean i'm sure there is a point where hey i'm making so many pages and obviously the number of pages in the book affect the printing price which affects the price that we all pay at the end of it and yeah at some point you probably need to make a decision 
Is it worth having an extra 10 pages, which bumps up the price, blah, 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 blah. Obviously, with the way the Kickstarter is going, that has not been an issue. And I think given that they're doing this kind of hardback, it, I think, has a, and, you know, that's not something like, uh, what is some of the other ones, like Saddle Stitch or something, where it, I know that sometimes with the different bindings, they have, like, max amount of pages you can have, things like that. But it seems like this is a no-brainer. I totally do not mind the larger print. I like the bold headers. I like the bolding that they're using in the text to call out different things. I'm not going to go through all these. I think it's interesting that you can kind of tell the monsters that are more that are either through the uh, OGL or something else or sort of in the domains of so things like aboliths and things are there and dark mantles and other things. And of course, some things will be different. Giant dung beetles, enter camps, ooh, stone golems and deep gnomes. Perkins says, I like having white space to add my own notes, comments, and coloring the black and white images. Fun. That's cool. I never, I've always felt like I, I never wanted, to, I felt like I was not adding, I, I was not adding value to my books by doing that. So I always try to keep them in, in their original condition. But I always thought it was neat. Someone had found, I think, somewhere, and they posted pictures. It might have been one of the uh, subreddits of somebody who had taken either was a deities and demigods or a monster manual and they'd colored in a bunch of stuff. And the ones they colored in looked really good. But the problem was the ink had, seep through so there was some damage to or you know just it added some illegibility to the pages opposite the the artwork that they colored but that's cool as i've had to buy books back that i had it back and they don't have anymore and i've rebought it was always cool to get somebody's version and see some little notes in there that i don't mind so much but i don't i don't know i don't feel comfortable doing them myself so we got some monsters we got some treasure Oh, here we go. Oh, wait a minute. This might be good. I always like these. They, it's weird that they don't. It, it, it's kind of an example of play, if not with any mechanics, then at least an idea of what the game. And I, I wish they would put this up front or put this on the player side because I think these are always good. Good to show somebody. Here's kind of what the game is going to look like. I always like that in all the ones. Like here's here's what's going on in this. We're going to take five minutes of game time and we're going to parse it out. We're going to have the players calling out what their characters are doing. We're going to have what roles are being made and kind of all this stuff. I like it. So let's let's read what this example is. It looks like this is just in the fiction. It's not. We're not getting the mechanical parts, but even still, we can get an idea of here's what we feel like in the fiction of this game. Things are going to look like. So Tormund fumed and huffed, lowering Relina bit by bit. The rope groaned where it was wrapped around his waist and hands. More slack, Relina called up from inside the wide square pit. Oh, Jorbin, not Torbin. Jorbin let a few more lengths slide by. Not that much, Relina shrieked a moment later. The dwarf growled an oath and hauled the rope back. Krieg sat cross-legged next to the pit and puffed on his pipe. Fifty gold, the dwarf drops her, he said. Araga, a holy templar of St. Taragnus, cast a disdainful look at the wizard. You know my beliefs on gambling, she said. She raised an index figure, 100 gold, or you're a coward. I got it, Relina shouted from below. Everyone scrambled to look. At the bottom of the pit, the halfling stood before a black pedestal. She lifted a sparkling grapefruit-sized sapphire overhead. See, she said, and all of you stewing about traps. Behind Relina, a puff of air hissed. Everyone froze. The pedestal sank into the floor with a clockwork grind. The pit's walls began trembling. A reverberating tick-tock picked up speed. Krieg's shout broke the spell. Get her out! Iraga and Jorbin pulled up the rope in frantic, in chaotic, frantic unison. The ticking hit a peak as Krieg reached down for Relina's hand. Boom! The pit's crushing walls slammed together. Next to it, the four crawlers lied in a tangled heap. Didn't even drop it, said Relina's muffled voice. Okay, there we go. Perkins says they do have two copies of OSC. I actually have two copies of uh, Rules Compendium. I think it's the one I have two of. And I do have two copies of BX. I have one that's kind of in better shape and one that's sort of my practical copy. And I also have Beck Me, so I kind of, uh, similar. So I got, you know, there's some, I do have some overlap going on. Okay. So this is really just about treasure and traps and it's in the fiction. So we're not getting kind of, it would have been nice. I think it would have been nice, even if it was just in some parenthetical to say what had happened. You know what what kind of roles were made and what the GM was doing, but we get an, we get a sense of the the danger, the treasure. Right, this is what it's all about. Here it is. We're getting treasure. We're uh, and there's going to be dangerous and and so the uh, in this case they they got the treasure and they got out and nobody got squished. 
Perkins says there used to be X copies of $5 price tags on them. I don't think they have that anymore. Let's see. So we have treasure uh, fleeting. So carousing allows PCs to gain XP fast, but they'll soon need to go adventuring and to replenish their empty pockets. All right. So there's uh, there's some kind of carousing rules. We have some treasure tables dealing with loot, magic item value. Great. And then we're having treasure zero to three. I don't know what that means. What's treasure zero to three? Treasure tables. You can use treasure tables to randomly determine what loot a monster is carrying. The table the monster uses for, oh, uses corresponds to its level. Okay, so a level which I'm guessing is hit dice. So from zero hit dice to three hit dice, this is the possible treasure. And then we got some magic item stuff. Curses, benefits, personalities. I like that. And we have an idea generator, Kroll's Cape of the Covenant. That's cool. The Blessed Staff of Blood. Madeira's Skull of the Lich Queen. All good stuff. Uh, okay, no, nah, this is all fine. Consumables, that's fine. We get some magic items, bags of holding, braces of defense, cloaks of elven kind. I think we can see kind of what these things are all about. <clears throat> oh, do we get an adventure? A first to third level adventure for Shadow Dark. All right, cool. So this quick start, I got to uh, look. Kudos to the author as far as quick starts go. I feel like this is giving you well enough to get started with the game. So good on good on you. Let's see. Looker Books, what's up next? Okay. The Red Devil will find you one way or another. Muggins Greenbottle, renowned tomb raider, renowned tomb robber. Why do they say raider? And there's a video walkthrough that you can get. Cool. But why do you need a video walkthrough when you've got me? Probably because it's better, but you know. Okay, we got a room key, background. Long ago, a mighty enclave of warriors lived inside the lost citadel. They worshipped bulls and ever bloodier cultish rituals that culminated in their leader, Minoros, transforming to, into the Scarlet Minotaur. The, this immortal avatar of rage slaughtered the warriors in a single night of mayhem. However, some of their servants escaped through the unseen halls used by the lowly. These beast men hid in the fallen citadel, trapped by superstitious fear of the outside. Okay, so we've got a, a main bad guy who's the Scarlet Minotaur. And now we're getting the factions of which we know one of which is the beast men. So these are gray furred feral beings that, that have evaded the Scarlet Minotaur for generations. They dwell in Area 23, not to be confused with Area 54. Believing dragons wait outside to devour anyone who leaves the citadel. Endless fear has made them vicious and craven. Their leader, Rogath, rules by the might of his claws. Ettercaps. Recently, a group of Ettercaps crept into Area 4 from the caves below the citadel. They slink through the Minotaur haunted halls, tempted by forgotten gems and gold. They plan to depart as soon as we have enough loot, a moment which never seems to arrive. They are leaderless and unanimously greedy. And then finally, the Scarlet Minotaur, towering blood red snorting and frothing it plows through the labyrinthine halls of the lost citadel looking for creatures to slay the minotaur returns to area 18 between patrols oh arteza pencils perkins i don't know what they are but they sound cool so we have some rumors i'm not going to read them but there's six of them if you need them the lost citadel environs and entrances the citadel itself we have a description here for i guess the outside cicadas buzz in the arid scrubland around the citadel thick Sandy blocks and coral red columns hold up its tiered rooftops, 30 to 40 feet high and flat. The enclosed interior is a cool, dark maze of vaulted chambers and halls that funnel into a central courtyard. Southeast doors lead to Area 1. They are carved with bucking bulls mid-leap. Northeast hall, as a, as a shattered door, lies before a stairwell to Area 10. An open tunnel leads into the labyrinth. And then there's a courtyard that's open air. Rooftop climbers can reach it. Now we have this section called Order, Order of Battle. Beast men are going to retreat towards Area 14 or Area 23, avoiding Area 18. No location of all secret doors. Lead enemies into bowl statue traps will not leave hiding to help others terrified of making noise. Okay, so that's kind of cool stuff. So when you, you need to know what the beast men are likely to do, here you have their standard, standard operating procedure. This is what they're likely to do. They're going to retreat towards one of two areas. They're going to avoid another area. They know all the secret doors. Presumably that means they might use them if they go to convenient spots for them. 
They're going to try to lead folks into traps. They're not going to, they're going to hide uh, above all and they want to be as quiet as possible. For the Edder Caps, they creep along the ceiling, avoiding bull statues, unaware of secret doors. They retreat towards Area 4 and gang up to assist allies. They are distracted by treasure, reluctant to area, enter Area 18. So the, so the couple of actionable things are going to be in the ceiling, which is kind of cool, because it's definitely once you become aware of them, you're going to have to start looking up as well as side to side. You could use treasure to distract them. Maybe they, you can think about how you might make your players aware of that fact or at least the possibility of that particular approach. And they're also probably not going to want to enter Area 18, which is going to be interesting if your party's in a situation where they're in some kind of battle and they start moving towards Area 18 and folks folks start to stop following them, start to stop. Folks just decide, choose not to follow them as they get closer to there. And then the Scarlet Minotaur pursues its quarry and never retreats, unaware of secret doors, forgets, about unseen foes in one to, one to six rounds, returns to Area 18 at least once an hour. The Scarlet Mentor is very single-minded. I don't know whether I like that or not, but I guess at least it's it's uh, we have these other we have these other factions that got a little bit more going on. So this thing being basically a force of nature that's just careening around and then basically going to recharge. I guess it's okay. Well, Perkins, they did give them goals for the for the uh, the factions. I mean, the Beastmen, okay, but they're not great goals, right? The Scarlet Minotaur's goal is just bloodshed. That's it. The Edder Caps want they're greedy. They want treasure, so that's that's their goal. Presumably, like they say in the faction description, they're they're kidding themselves that there'll be some amount of treasure that will be enough because there never is. But they say, oh, we'll leave when we've got enough, and they they never get enough. But they want treasure. The Beastmen are just trying to survive is their goal. They feel like the outside world is closed off to them because of dragons that are going to slaughter them. Maybe you could even convince them otherwise. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, they don't have complicated goals. They don't really. So I'll say this. They're not really goals that you can fulfill, right? So if we're going to say, and we, of course, we're, we haven't gotten all that far into it, but if we were going to say, hey, there's, uh, you know, what's missing here is, I can't, the party can kill the Minotaur or get killed by the Minotaur. That's about it. The Edder Caps, they can't, they're never going to be able to give the, the Edder Caps enough loot to make them leave because they always want more loot. And then the Beastmen doesn't seem like they're going to follow them out. Maybe you can convince them, but they're not. So in terms of maybe we could say their goals are not particularly, they have some kind of goals. They're not particularly actionable for the party. There's not much for the party there to glean of, ooh, if we can only, if only we can get the beast man this thing, beast man this thing, they will join us or we could join them or something like that. Like, there's not there. Oh, the Edder Caps. If only we do this, we can use the Edder Caps in some way. There, there's nothing like that. Now, of course, you can add them in. It's just as written, nothing like that. And yes, Perkins says the Minotaur wants to kill stuff. Yes. It's a very simple enemy in that way. So the danger level healer is risky. You're going to check for an encounter every two rounds. Or after they make loud noises, and remember, 1d6 on a 1, you get an encounter. Light is total darkness unless otherwise noted. Doors are stone, 1 in 6 chance of being stuck shut, unlocked unless noted. NPCs will see them later. And then the Scarlet Mentor, each time you roll on the random encounters table after the first time, apply cumulative minus 2 to the result. So you treat results below 1 as 1. Reset this count each time an encounter with a Scarlet Minotaur occurs. So basically, the more you're running around here, the more likely you're going to dial up the Scarlet Minotaur. And then once you've dialed up the Scarlet Minotaur once, presumably if you haven't killed it, you're running away, you hide, whatever, and then you reset the count. So you're going to get the Scarlet Min Minotaur presumably at some stage. Though, you know, you could get lucky and not roll ones. So it's not a total... Um, it's not, you know, it's 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 not a foregone conclusion that you'll get a random Scarlet Minotaur attack. But the more often you're rolling on that, the more often chances are you're going to get it. Now we get the room descriptions. I didn't see a, where was there a map of this inside? Let's see if there's a map just to see what the map is like. Here we go. So this is a fairly large, fairly large location. So you're coming in and out through here. I like that they wrote on here people here so presumably there's an, an some kind of monster or somebody individual called eska over here their editor caps over here i do i, I appreciate that Sca scarab swarms over here let's see in terms we do have some kind of loops they're sort of big but we definitely i think have some yeah there's one big loop kind of here where you can 
depending, you can sort of go through one and go around and around and secret door, even not secret door, come around. Secret, I guess you got to go through the secrets. Some of these secrets, you come through there. Loops through here. That's not one. But here we have another through here. Let's see. There's a, here's one there. So we have a few. A few. It's a nice map. Yeah, Perkins says nice map. It is a nice map. And like I said, I, I like I like calling that out here. And it's a good looking map. It's not uh, it's it's not too far on the aesthetics. I like the fact that hey, secret doors easy to, easy to see. There where a secret door is. There's no kind of confusion. Big, nice, bold S, white on a black. Boom, secret. I I like it. I can see it right away. Some of these other things, I'm not sure what that is. It has an L. Is there another one like that somewhere else? Or is that just a number? Is that supposed to be? No, that says definitely think says L. Here's Geo. So there are some letters for some things. We'll have to see what that is. So let's just see. I'm just going to go through a couple of these rooms to see how they're kind of lining, lining things up here. So we have the mural chamber, walls, floor to floor, ceiling, murals painted in vibrant jewel tones, red pillars, tapered, banded in black marble at top and bottom, and then some more details on the mural. So here we have basically have these. This is that style that we've seen in things like uh, Dolman Wood and other kind of modern modules where we're not giving... We're not giving read aloud text. Instead, we're we're giving out the the sort of uh, descriptors to the DM, and then the DM will create their own their own custom read aloud text, or they'll read it aloud after reading it. So we see that the sort of the main things here: are the walls, red pillars with murals, the murals, people in white robes kneeling in the room of red pillars. There's a hidden niche in there, and then we have the editor cap NPC Eska who's weaselly and disloyal. I like that. We get some two kind of adjectives to describe the NPC to give us something personality-wise, who just hit an area pearl, uh, a stolen pearl in the next area, hides on the northeast corner of the ceiling, screeches an alarm and flees towards area four if attacked. And then I guess if it escapes, then some of the editor caps from area four will set an ambush in the next room. Oh, someone says there was an icon key, or I should say someone. Kyle Gray says, oh, I see. Yep, L, locked DC20. Okay, thanks, I missed that. Okay, so that L is applying to that door. Locked DC20, DC20 dex pick, DC18 strength force. All right, that's good. And then there's something G is barricaded DC18 strength. So that's that. I wonder why they used L makes sense, but what is G, like a gate? Is that why they use G as opposed to... B for barricade, G for gate. That's still, it's cool. All right, cool. And then S, secret door, wall silently rotates. Yeah, I do like, that's nice. Nice. All right, so I like these room descriptions. I do like the style. I don't need the, I don't need the read aloud text. I just kind of want to know what's going on. I always, I guess in this case, it's not too bad because the the editor cap is kind of hidden. But I always, I, the one thing I don't like is it's kind of like you have all this stuff and then you get the NPC. And I'm curious how it goes when the NPC is more obvious. Because in this case, the Eska is hiding in the northeast corner. So it could be something they could miss. But I, I do like, or my personal preference is when there are NPCs that are obviously in the room, put that up front. Because I'm imagining when you open the door and you see a five orcs standing in front of you, the first things to your mind that you're going to come are not what's the walls and the back thing and all oh, the murals. It's like, no, there are five orcs in front of you and everything else is going to come after, after that. Um, but I understand if it's, you know, there's, you want to make things formatted a certain way, you know, just uh, to keep things kind of orderly and to by pattern. So I get, if you decide, okay, this is where I'm putting NPCs, but just personally, if I'm reading through it, if there's some big NPC in the room, put that up front. Because that's the one I want to know first. Oh, there's a red dragon. I'm describing this cave and everything. And it's like, oh, wait, the most important thing is that there's a huge red dragon in front of you. Maybe that's the thing you're going to notice first and not the beauty of the natural walls of this cavern or something like that. Perkins says it might be a squished bee. It might be. It might be. 
Uh, let's see. Anything else here? I'm just kind of looking at the... Uh, okay, so here's 18 where the Minotaur is. At least here the Minotaur is kind of put up front. So we have a bull statue that's 20 feet tall, black onyx, rippling muscle, horns lowered and dotted with white objects. In the courtyard, it's sandy flagstones, sun-scorched, heaps of bleached bones, red pillars, freestanding, some shattered and crumbling, cast cool dark shadows. Scarlet Minotaur, there's a 3 in 6 chance of being present, a.k.a. 50%. If not, a cumulative 1 in 6 chance per round that returns. The Minotaur is 9 feet tall, wine red fur, charges at shadows, headbutts pillars, snorts, and bellows. Two-headed bronze, plus one great axe called Bloodlust, wielder deals times 4 damage, 4 times damage on a critical hit. Well, don't get hit. That's a, that's a squisher. That's a game ender right there. We'll have to see on the stats if this is these things, the charging at shadows and stuff is mechanized headbutting pillars. If that's something like it's almost blind or blinded, permanently blinded by rage, so really it's just random, or is that just for flavor? Hey, Brian Smith. I don't think you'll have trouble running it on Friday, Brian Smith. I, I feel confident that a, a, a GM of your caliber will be able to wrap your head around this. Bull statue, 30 humanoid skulls in various states of rot, punched onto horns like necklace beads. Some have traces of gray fur. You can make a ritual sacrifice of punching a freshly beheaded humanoid skull onto a horn, which grants a plus one point of strength each additional time. A cumulative one in four chance of transforming into a beast man. Oh, that's kind of an interesting risk reward for giving that a shot if you figure it out. So this is bones, and there's some treasure. Cool. I want to, uh, let's see, where is, so let's see, where is, uh, where is our man? Hold on a minute. Is it, where's our, where's our man Scarlet Minotaur? Uh, see page 64. Where is the, did I not, did I miss the Scarlet Minotaur? I guess I'll have to go back to monsters to see, because maybe it's just a plain Minotaur that just has Scarlet Ferks, I don't see anything else. So we do have some beast man names and stuff. That's cool on the other caps. I like that. Um, where would the stats be for? Okay, well, I just want to curious about the Minotaur. So let's go back and find those stats. That would have been a nice thing to put. Like, hey, go see here for the stats. You know, Minotaur AC fourteen, hit points thirty four, two attacks with the. Great axe, or at this point, he's got us an even better one. And one horns. Movement is near. Uh, strength, dex, con, int, whiz, charisma. Uh, let's see, was that alignment? Chaotic level seven. Charge in place of attacks, move up to double, to double near in a straight line and make one horn attack. If you hit, it's times two damage. If you hit. I'll have to get used to that make a near attack i'd almost rather it say uh you can move up to something that's far because i don't know what is i'm not sure what double near means in this instance this also means that the um i think I, i'm not sure why they didn't do this give like because the thing about the charging at shadows and headbutting stuff seems very it seems like i i i, I feel like it's setting up for this Minotaur, the Scarlet Minotaur, to be a little different than just a bog standard Minotaur, but it's it's not. And maybe that bums me out slightly. So go back in there, and if you run this, add in some fun stuff with the Scarlet Minotaur. Maybe make it stronger, but then have it randomly do things. Like it sees the party there, and instead of attacking them, it rams into a pillar or something. Maybe even it can, it, it, there's some effect of what happens if it does ram into a pillar. Maybe it something gets something out of it, like it's uh, psyching itself up. You know, I don't know. It, it would have been it would have been a little bit neat to have a little bit more than that. But, um, you know, yes, double near Brian Smith. It's obviously I, I'm guessing what it is is you're moving to something else. So there's kind of what is it near? Is it near distant far? Let's go back and take a look at that because that is an interesting way of doing movements. So okay, so we have close, near, and far. So double near. I don't know. I'm not really sure. So you move near. It might be in the other book. Do I need to bring out the other book? 
Do we have movement in here? All right, let me see about getting the other book up because I don't know what that means. I'm just going to switch back to me for a second. I don't know what that means. Let's go back and pull out the um, pull up the character, the character, the PC players guide, and let's see what double near is. Here we go. All right, give me a moment. Scott Pyle says it's about sixty feet. Okay. Oh, uh, page display. No. Two page view. All right. Is it coming? There we go. Yeah, Perkins says uh, index card RPG is just close, near, far for distance. How does it move? So Perkins, how does uh, while I'm looking this up, how does how does um, how does it handle moving from one to another? How does it? Because I, I think I would have. I guess I to me when I think of this kind of abstraction, which I like. Hey, close, near, far, great. I would have rather just said that no, normally you can use you can move from one. So normally if you're have nothing in close your normal move gets you can anything that's near you and then you're you know and then it so i would have put for the minotaur that it is to me double near okay that says about 60 feet which i think is what somebody somebody said right um but i would have rather just said okay you can move to anything that's far anything that you could see you can basically run up there you could do some kind of crazy dash but um, yeah, moving up near, I mean, I guess it's like, okay, you move near, so you move from here to here. It is like a double move, and then anything that was near to you is now close. I, it's fine. I guess it's just another way of doing it. It, it. it feels a little bit, at first read, maybe fiddlier for me. Um, but, you know, it's not like you don't figure it out. Like, yeah, I get what they mean. It's, got, it's a double move. It's basically a double move. I just feel like wanted to say you can move to far. Normally, you can only move to near. If you double move, you can move to anything that's far. Though far, I, maybe the deal is a far is, is kind of vague. I would have liked to have distance, maybe a far be like 120 feet and then distant anything beyond that. Because that does mean that if you're outdoors, like what is what does within sight mean? So I can see there, if you were fighting the Minotaur outside, it's like, what are you on a mountaintop and it can within sight so that the Minotaur can speed up to you like he's Quicksilver uh, from the Marvel comics? Like probably not, you know, um, but it's fine. It's fine. Yes, Perkins. I, but I think I, I think there's some point with the fact that I, I think I, I understand the concepts. I believe if I could read between the lines, because far is close is very specific in terms of distance. Near specific in terms of distance. Far not specific at all in terms of distance. So what they probably want to say is they don't want to stretch it to someone saying, "Yeah, but they're on the horizon." It says within sight, and I can see them. And you're like, "No, it's so it's really you're just moving," you know trying to make it a cool of 60 feet i probably like i said i probably would have added one more one more uh distance in there that is kind of like yeah you could see it but it's not in engagement range you have to be at least within this thing otherwise you can't engage it you can see it and you can start running towards it but it's not something you can get to um yeah kevin says yep says that the core issue is that far covers too much ground yep 30 to infinity so they need something in between near and far yeah that's what i would have done i would have put something and put far as distant put far as far which i like and then have distant as to be like yeah it's out there somewhere i mean in terms of the minotaur it actually doesn't matter too much right because you're in an enclosed space you're either somewhere within the labyrinth or somewhere within in that courtyard if you meet in the room so in that case you can deal with it as being far because within the, the, the bounds of the rooms are going to give you natural things to which it can't see across. You don't have to worry about it speeding across. It has to be able to see you. And if you're around the corner, it can't see you. So that's, that's not a big deal, but it's just more in, in I'm just thinking of it in other, if I were to pull this out of context, play it somewhere else, like suddenly that within sight, if you're using that as, you know, you just say it can move to far. It just gives it way too much. Way too much ground to cover. Uh, what else anyone got going on? All right. Melee is close and near. Oh, really? I would have thought melee is close. See, I think I just would have liked another thing in there because I'm thinking for, for uh, you know, melee is close. 
I would have put you know, missile weapons near and far. And then again, I would have had distant. And then if you're in distant, you're outside of, you're basically outside of what I would call engagement range, whatever you can engage with in, in, in some way, but whatever, it's not a big deal at all. Uh, but I don't like the, I guess for me, I just don't like a, a double near move. Like, it doesn't roll off the tongue for me, <clears throat> but you know, I'm sure you get over it in short order. And, and that's not, maybe it'll come, maybe it would come up in a player facing role, but for me, it's behind the screen. So I don't, I'm not like declaring to the characters. It's doing a double near, you know, Perkins says melee depends on reach. I got you, but I would have thought that I would have just had close is basically within. It, it, I, I mean, that's the one when you have these kinds of, uh, I don't know what, what would we call them? Fuzzy things, right? Fuzzy uh, distances. You do end up in some weird stuff, right? So if you can melee and near distance, is that you moving and meleeing uh, reach weapons? I mean, there's just stuff in there. I don't know how it even handles reach weapons. Actually. Does there anything about reach weapons? I wonder if there is. Let me, let's see. Do we have anything about weapons? Uh, background stats, ancestry gear. Let's see that. I know that they had, uh, I think there were some kind of tags that we looked at, right? So finesse, versatile, two-handed range. You can use a weapon at close, near, or far range. See distances. Yeah, so your swords are all at close. Close, close, crossbow up to far. Close or near if you throw it, I'm presuming. Javelin, close or far if you throw it. There does not seem to be from this spear, close, or near, I guess, if you're throwing it, or no. Yeah, thrown. Uh, it doesn't seem to have, we don't, I'm not seeing any halberd, polearm kind of thing here. So we're, you're, you're losing a bit of that uh, first rank, second rank kind of thing. You're in close, you're in close. I also don't see any rules for flanking or anything like that, or... Uh, any different sort of movement types that I saw anyway. Do we miss? Let me just, I'm just going to go back so I can go to combat. Did we miss anything in combat? Maybe that would have explained. The K5K says that they understand this was meant to overcome being unable to move that extra five feet to be able to move an attack and introduces more problems in their opinion. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, this is probably where I want to play through it a few times. It's definitely, I, I feel like here's where it might fall short for some folks, right? You don't have your pole arms. If you're someone who like, oh, I love pole arm master coming from fifth edition or like me, I just love having pole arms so I can be in that second rank and attack. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have it. You don't have opportunity attacks, I believe, which is great. I don't like opportunity attacks, but at the same time, I liked in BX that you could, uh, the sort of, if you're trying to do a, they have a difference between a fighting withdrawal and just a full on turn and run, which had consequences. I like that, so I would miss that a little bit. Of course, I could add that back in. Not a big deal, but, you know, just in terms of what we're giving up a little bit here, it seems like. So there's no sense of, there's no uh, tactics here in terms of your positioning, right? Because you're either in close, in which case it's just a big mosh pit. If you're all together, it's just assumed, I guess, you're in kind of a swarm position, and then you're, or you're not. Now, of course, you can add in these elements, but there's no advantage, it seems like, for positioning yourself. I mean, I guess there's advantages for, say, not being in a spell radius or something like that, but it's kind of hard to say. I mean, maybe we could look at a spell. What's like their fireball do in terms of how is it deciding who it hits and who it doesn't hit? Is there one? Let's just see fireball. Do we have a fireball? Oh, let's just see. We have acid arrow. That just hits one person. I'm looking for basically your AOE type spell. So burning hands, you got to be close. You spread your fingers with thumbs touching, releasing a circle of flames that fills a close area around where you stand. Creatures within the area of effect take 1d6 damage. Unattended flammable objects ignite. So does that mean that anybody who's in close with you? So I, I, one thing I, I always say, they took burning hands, which I always think of, you know, you do this and then flames go outwards from you, which means it would be important to know who's in front of you and use rules for cones or wherever they're doing it to decide where the stuff's going. Now they've basically turned it into you're the center of it. And from what I'm, at least my interpretation of this is it's kind of moving outwards from you in all directions. So anybody who's in close with you, which depending on things go, could be a lot of people just take 
take damage. So it's definitely a different way of doing things. Let's see. Brian Smith says, no problem for my group. Even my wife agreed to play. She is a total noob. Oh, that's cool. Good luck then. Van Davis says, it's basically OSC in tone and basic mechanics. Cross with some of the streamlining from Index Card RPG for people that haven't worked up the interest or the nerve to try either of those. They really like it. I'm backing it, but the YouTube hype train is going <laughs> nuts. Yes, I am. I wouldn't put myself in the YouTube hype train. But yes, I've, I haven't watched any of those videos, but I've seen them. I mean, it's fine. Like, I see some of the headlines, and I'm like, for real? I mean, like, having read the quick start, it's great. It's fine. It's fine. It's nice. But I, I see the kind of raving about it. It's like, I don't know, it's remaking the wheel. But again, maybe some of those folks are, I think it's, it, it, I think part of like my thing, and I think obviously for folks who are in here in this chat, a lot of us have been in the community, have been reading the blog posts. Have, I mean, look, I do it every week. I go into the OSR and other subreddits and we look up stuff and we say there. And so you've seen a lot of these elements separately. So when you see someone put them together, it's like, wow, that's really nice. But it's not like, oh my gosh, amazing. But of course, if you take somebody who has not been involved in any of that, and they haven't seen any of that stuff, and they've been totally on the side because they've just been doing fifth edition or been doing something else. They're just not in that vein. It is not how they participate. And then suddenly you put all this stuff in front of them. Then I think maybe do it like, oh my gosh, this is all new. But for a lot of us, it comes off a little bit like, okay, but we had this going on already. Like, great. This people have been, you know, you probably look at blog posts 15 years ago that were talking about these same things, and nobody, nobody gifted them with tens of thousands of dollars, or they just put it out for free, right? It's but there is an art to putting this stuff together, and I totally want to give the author credit for finding that right mix, I think, and putting it together. Uh, and it, it, and it seems very well done and it's, and it, it seems like it's all, she linked it together in a way in which it makes sense as a, as a single product. It does not feel like a hodgepodge of stuff, even though I can look and I can see beneath the surface a little bit and say like, Oh yeah, this is from here. Yeah. This is from index card RPG. This is from DCC. This is from the black hack. But she did put it together in a way where you don't see the seams and you can just in, enjoy it, embrace it as its own sort of unified thing, which is nice. Uh, yes, this game is definitely, yeah, the groundbreakingness of this game is definitely going to depend on where you're coming from. Absolutely. Van Davis said that she put a lot of money into marketing and doesn't and it doesn't hurt when she basically got all the big YouTubers for OSR raving about it. Yeah, I don't even know if she paid. I mean, I, I don't know the author personally. I know that she's, been around for a while making adventures, DMs Guild, other things. And some people have said, because there's been some talk, if you go to this OSR subreddit about the sort of marketing blitz, and people have definitely felt like, have been like, oh, I'm getting hyped too much on this. But someone, I've heard some people say that she's actually friends with some of those folks. She knows them. And so whether she paid for it or whether they, she, they, you know, they're just helping her out. Like, look, if somebody I knew put out something, I would hype it up probably if I, I mean, I wouldn't lie about it, but I'd probably like, yeah, this is my boy, girl, whomever they put this thing out. I think this is awesome. I want to share it with you kind of thing. And if they're her, her peoples and she, and, and, you know, they want to do it. And that's kind of cool. Like questing beast. I think it was, it, it, he flagged his thing, I think. And again, I haven't watched it, but from what I understand, it's kind of promotional. So people were speculating that she paid for that and go for it. I mean, that's what you should do. I mean, Marketing this kind of stuff isn't sin. Like we want to be successful. I want to be successful in what I do. I want people to be successful. Marketing is part of that. Heck, my day job, I am attached to marketing teams. <laughs> so I don't begrudge somebody marketing. It's kind of interesting how it's hitting people wrong, but I feel like there's this big kind of garage band sort of rough aesthetic and that runs counter to it when something seems so polished and put together and smooth and you don't feel like they've gone through all the hardships that the Maybe the rest of us have, but you know, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. Catherine says that a lot of friendly courtesy mixed in with paid promo. That's, that's a probably a good way to put it. Well, all right, folks, even though I'm finishing this with the uh, players quick start, if you, if you missed, if you uh, didn't see my coverage of the player quick start guide, I did it sort of impromptu as part of Friday's OSR or sorry, I just call it now. Game Master Community Roundup. So if you check that one out from last Friday, it's uh, if you're looking at it on YouTube, you you might everything's in tabs. So go to the channel, then go to uh, live, and you will see it there. You can check that out. It, it starts in probably ten or fifteen minutes in, or someone might even Catherine mentioned uh, Shadow Dark, and I pledged ignorance because I literally hadn't heard of it. I just don't have my pulse on that stuff. Maybe like I should. And then I, we sort of went down the rabbit hole and then checked that out. And then, of course, this video, this stream went over the Game Master's Guide. If I was just going to kind of 
put like a full circle thing in. I think this is a fine rule set. I would not say that there was anything wrong with folks who end up looking at this and saying, this is the kind of mix that I wanted of old school and new school and modern and all of that stuff. There's definitely things that I'm like, oh yeah, this is a really great idea. Some stuff I'm like, well, I like it, but maybe I don't like love it, this implementation of it. And some things like, oh, I wish they had implemented this thing, but I get it. You have to make decisions based on your design parameters. Somebody said that she tested this for multiple years, so, and I don't doubt it. It comes across as being very, very professional, very well laid out. I didn't run into tons of typos or anything like that. Everything seems to, to fit together. Um, is this an evolutionary, oh my gosh, greatest thing since sliced bread? No, especially if you're familiar with the OSR community and you've been, if you've been hacking up games and looking at lots of hacks and doing that for any amount of time, none of this is going to seem new to you. None of this is going to seem particularly even, uh, you know, it's certainly not evolutionary, not even revolutionary, maybe not even novel, but for a lot of folks, all the refugees coming out of maybe the fifth edition ecosystem, this is going to be a lot more, feel a lot more new and interesting than it might feel to some of us who are like, ah, we've been, we've been reading this stuff for years. And like I said, I feel like part of this is I could take my favorite rule set and do some of this too and do it. But you know, someone went through the trouble of doing that for me. Uh, the, the book looks really nice, nice hardback, which of course is appealing to a lot of people. So it makes a really appealing package. And there seems to be a lot of stuff going on and a lot of hype. I don't necessarily think the hype is misplaced. But just, you know, be aware of what you're getting. And I, as I said, I, I'm going to keep giving kudos for, to her for putting out these quick start guides. Really, I encourage you, if you haven't pledged for this yet and you're interested and you're curious, but you haven't made your decision yet, read these quick starts. Or you can watch these streams where I went through them. But really, it's all there for you. You can read pretty much. I'm guessing that the full rules are going to be just more of this. But I think that this... I imagine this is going to give you, it seems to be very complete on its own. You could play with just these quick start rules and get very far. I, I will be curious to see what the complete rules have. Maybe the complete rules will have more on the overland travel kind of stuff. Cause that's somewhere where I can say that they don't give you the, there's, there's not enough mechanics to run it, but maybe not to what I like. And so maybe that's something that'll get fleshed out more in the full rules. I don't. I don't know. We will see. I did reach out to see if I can get a copy of the rules. I have not heard back. I don't I don't expect to hear back. I'm probably not going to pledge this myself uh, just because I don't feel like this fills a niche for me that I need. I'm really curious about it. I'm interested to read it, but I don't I don't need it. I don't need another book like this. Uh, it's not it's for for me anyway. It's not giving me enough that I feel the need to add it to my library, but I'm, I am keenly interested in, and I would love the chance to look at it if that opportunity comes along. But I think the quick starts give a great idea. And if you don't feel like reading it yourself, you can just watch a couple hours of me reading through it. And there you go. Any last stuff from the chats? Yes, please throw, throw your notes, Brian Smith, of your playthrough on the forum. Kyle asks, can you play everything with the available free documents? I believe you can. Yeah, it has, it has everything you'll need. You may find some holes in it, depending on the kind of game you're going to run. There is an adventure in there too, which is also excellent. It's very simple. It's I don't think it's going to knock anybody's socks off of, oh my gosh, what the, the best adventure ever. It's very kind of simple and simplistic, but it's probably good for not only for new players, just maybe to run through, but also new GMs, just to kind of wrap your mind around the rules. If you want to play that adventure, I think it's totally runnable and you can add more detail and more stuff on it if you want to, but it's nice that it's even, even there. So you have that also. But yeah, I think the quick starts, for these two quick starts, you have everything you need to run some sessions of it and get a feel for it. Uh, any last stuff before I uh, close it off? Perkins says, looks like this has a lot to offer. It might be good for a quick game or two. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think it's really going to depend where you are, where you are in your journey, your sort of OSR slash NSR, or really just your role-playing game kind of journey. It's it's for some people, it's going to hit them right in their sweet spot, I imagine. For other folks, it's going to seem kind of, what's the big deal about this sort of thing, right? But that's, I think the audience is really the, the former. The, the people who are kind of disillusioned, disenchanted with fifth edition or just want to try something else, and they're interested maybe in these types of play they've heard about, but they're too daunted by all the stuff around it that gateway, that bridge. I think that's what this is trying to be. And it seems like from reading it that, that it's doing a pretty good job of being that bridge. I mean, I could quibble with decisions all day, but that's everyone's going to have those kind of quibbles. And nothing I'm nothing I've said that like, oh, I wish they did this a little bit differently. It doesn't really mean much. It's just how I like to run or play a game versus that, which is, you know, everyone's individual. Terrence says, sounds like fun. They'd play. Yep. 
maybe Terrence, maybe if somebody we know gets the rules, we can try it. Uh, yeah, forums.hex.press, Kyle. I'll put it in the chat. I'm not going to put the HTTPS. We be small but fierce over there. Always looking for new people. I don't feel like I've reached the kind of uh, the uh, what's the the. I feel like you have to get certain momentum going, and then things kind of. So there's, it's not a ton of activity because I only have a, a few people who are active, and we're not posting a ton. But it's a place if you're looking for if you're looking for me and you want to have more of a back and forth. I don't have a Discord right now. I've got some other things cooking that I'm working on, so I'll. I'll talk about those soon but that's kind of the spot spot to go uh if you're looking for me kind of outside social media stuff and it's a forum which i like i like that better than discord discord for a lot of types of interaction so that's kind of what i'm doing i'm going old school in all things old school in my role playing old school in my social media all right, folks. Well, have a great day. If you give a thumbs up on your way out, that would be awesome. If you found yourself in here and not subscribed to the channel and you like this sort of thing, it's kind of the sort of thing that we do here. So if you feel like giving it a subscription, subscribe, that would also be awesome. Have a great rest of your day, night, whenever you end up watching, listen to this game on everybody. And I will talk to you later. Bye now.